Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 2 with me, Eric Earhart, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, we'll review last semester the prerequisites for this class, which is Chapter 1 in this semester's lecture notes. So here we are at the course webpage. I'm going to scroll on down to the lecture notes. So here is the PDF and the R code for Chapter 1. I recommend you open both of those. I'll open up the R code. And since this is a review of last semester, I'm going to go up to Teaching in ADA 1 and look at that tab. So recall from last semester, we covered all the univariate and bivariate standard methods for statistical analysis. We started off by learning something about R, which is the software programming language that we'll be using. Um, and we use that within the environment RStudio. That looks like this blue R. Here's the RStudio that we'll be using this semester again. Uh, we started by summarizing and displaying data, uh, creating simple plots and numerical summaries, as well as learning how to subset data and so on. Then we covered uh, the one sample t-test, two sample t-test, and analysis of variance, which are all methods for understanding the means of populations and how they relate to each other. We checked assumptions of those methods, in particular that the sampling distribution of the sample mean is normal, meaning it follows a normal or Gaussian distribution. And when it didn't, then we moved on to non-parametric methods for solving those sorts of problems. Then we turned our attention to estimating proportions in a population, such as the probability of success of some event in a, in a population, either just a, as a proportion or as a vector of proportions, as in the goodness of fit test, or when we compare two categories where we use the chi-square test of association. Then we looked at bivariate methods for two continuous variables, calculating correlation between variables and doing regression. And we also looked at logistic regression where we had a, a binary response variable, the y variable, either success or failure, against a continuous explanatory x variable. And uh, we also uh, talked a bit about cleaning, data cleaning, and then we did a lot with writing reproducible research documents using Markdown in our studio. So those are the things that you need to know going into this semester. And so back to the ADA2 website, if we go ahead and open up that PDF file, which I have here, I'm going to go through pretty quickly um, this document and point out the major things that you need to know. And if you don't know these things, I recommend uh, spending some time in this chapter making sure you know them, or going back to the uh, the chapters from last semester and reviewing that material so that you are prepared for uh, the material for this semester. So last uh, semester we talked about R, and um, R is a programming language. We used R inside of RStudio, and we wrote uh, programs and weaved that together in Markdown uh, to make those documents. So uh, there's an example here um, uh, for turkeys that were both from uh, West, I think, White, uh, let's see, Virginia and Wisconsin. And these turkeys uh, in this turkey data set have, uh, are of certain ages. Uh, have certain weights, and their origin are from Virginia and Wisconsin. And uh, so I would go through this, um, as I discussed in the previous video. Um, when you open up this R file, okay, when you open up this R file in Chapter 1, it looks like this. I would read this in, go ahead and save this. Um, to the appropriate place on your desktop, not desktop, um, on your computer, 
in your ADA2 folder, for example, maybe you've got a folder for lecture notes, make sure you remove that .txt if your computer tries to force that on you. Open that up in RStudio and um, run these lines of code and see that when you run a line of code, it puts that variable in the environment. And here I'm going to read in the dataset turkey. It submitted the line down here, and the turkey dataset came up here. And if we click on it, as I just did, uh, it will actually show you the table of that dataset or data frame. And as you run each of these, make sure that you understand why the output is the way it is. And if you don't understand that, ask a friend, come to office hours, ask in class. Um, if there's a line that you don't understand, put some sort of comment in there that you would be able to search for, and you can get your questions asked and answered. <laughs> All right, so back to lecture notes. So make sure you uh, understand how to subset uh, data from a data frame and print out the things that you want. Uh, for example, here's a creating a new variable, a logical variable, true, false, Boolean variable, which is whether the turkeys are older than 25 months. And you can see that creates a new variable that's logical and we have trues and falses depending on what their ages are. Remember to pause this video at any time that you need uh, some more time to review uh, or run the, the commands here. We can subset and ask which, which turkeys, which rows, have turkeys that are greater than 25 months old. And here all, all of these are true. All the greater than 25 months are true. So walk through all this and make sure that all of this makes sense to you. Um, another thing about uh, reading my code, I almost always have a comment before a line of code which describes either why I'm doing something or what I'm doing it for. So I guess what I'm doing it for is the same as the word why. And that is uh, so that um, if you are just reading the command, and you're not quite understanding what's going on, spend the extra time to read that, the associated comment. Um, that will probably answer your question. All right. In chapters 2, 4, and 6, we did one sample problems. So we have a, one population. We want to know something about the population mean or the median. And so uh, we used, we've used ggplot2, which is the grammar of graphics which was implemented by Hadley Wickham. Um, and it allows us to create plots where we assign aesthetics such as the x axis is going to be the weight. And then we, cr we overlay on those axes geometric objects or geoms, uh, such as a histogram, a density, and a rug. All of these are going to go into the same plot. And you can see that we start off by defining the axes in this first command, assign it to P, which I use as an object for a plot, and 1, 1 is just a sort of arbitrary number. And to that plot 1, 1, I'm going to add, so I do plot P11 one, one plus, I'm going to add this as a layer. So I first add the histogram, and then I put a density plot, a density curve over the histogram, and then I put a, a rug at the bottom of the plot. So if I scroll through not too fast, sorry. Um, let me scroll up again. I went faster than I meant to. Okay, here we are. So P11, all of these are in plot 11. I'm creating two other plots here, and all of this is for turkeys VA, which is turkeys VA here. These are all the turkeys that are from Virginia. All right, so if I scroll down to here, this first plot is those commands. I've got my histogram. Uh, weight is assigned to the x-axis. I've got the histogram, those white boxes. I've got the density curve, which is the pink curve. And then these tick marks at the bottom are the rug. All right, I'm going to keep 
scrolling on down now. Uh, you can check normality. I introduced this function last time to check the normality of the sampling distribution of the mean, estimating that using the bootstrap. So you basically, once you read this function into R, all the way down to this closed parenthesis, then you simply put in a data set right here. This is one column of the data frame, for the, in this case for the Virginia turkeys, and it produces these two plots on the left. One is just the histogram of the data itself, and this second plot is the distribution of the sample mean, or at least the boost bootstrap approximation to the sampling distribution. The red curve is the true is a is a true normal distribution. And if the black curve and the red curve are pretty close to each other, as these are, um, then I would feel comfortable with the conclusions of the t test. All right. Um, we can also do QQ plots to test normality where you plot the Uh, normal quantiles from a normal distribution versus the quantiles of the data distribution. And if the data distribution quantiles match up with the normal, which means I would follow this red line, then that suggests the data are normal. These error bars, the dashed dash lines, uh, most of the points should fall inside of there. Okay. Basically, I think it's uh, maybe, yeah, about you'd expect 95% of the points to be inside. In this case, these are small data sets, so we don't have a lot of evidence to reject the null hypothesis for normality. So we find that the data are not different with, from normality. There's also normality tests such as Shapiro-Wilkes, Anderson-Darling, and the Kramer von Mises test. All right. And some of these uh, require, such as the Anderson-Darling or Kramer von Mises, require larger sample sizes. We don't have enough evidence with only seven observations. So these are um, errors that are expected. Okay. Oops, I paged up by accident. Let me scroll back down. All right. T-test. We're going to test whether the population mean equals uh, a particular value, in this case, 12 pounds. All right, so make sure you know all about those t-tests. The Wilcox inside rank test is the non-parametric version when the normality assumptions do not hold. The next chapters, chapters 3, 4, and 6, were when we were comparing two samples. So when we have two samples, we want to have a visualization that compares those samples, and that will often be done by assigning two aesthetics, one aesthetic for the variable that is being plotted, such as weight, and the second variable, which is the category, for example, Virginia versus Wisconsin, uh, so that we plot the two populations, or the two samples, side by side. So these are all, if I zoom out a little bit, examples of plots that compare. Um, on Here on the y-axis is the origin, either Virginia at the bottom or Wisconsin at the top. And we've got dot plots. We have uh, dot plots on top of box plots. Here we've got uh, some histograms with the rug underneath, those little specks. Here are the two histograms laid on top of each other. And here are the two histograms where instead of laying on top of each other but be, be having, being half opaque or half transparent, um, so you can see through, here we've dodged the bars. And my preference in among these plots would be this histogram where you've got two facets or two small multiples um, or these box plots. I think those are the most informative. All right, there is a bootstrap function for comparing the sampling distribution of the difference between two sample means where this plots the, the two um, individual samples and then the sampling distribution of the difference in means. And this looks beautiful. That's about as good as it gets. 
uh, when you do a t-test, you can put in the two individual groups, Virginia weights and the Wisconsin weights, and you can either assume that the variances are equal or not equal, not equal is the default, and compare those means. All right, I recognize all this is going super fast, and that's because you, I expect that you know all this stuff already. But I'm just uh, giving you bullets for what you should remember. You can use the Wilcox and Rank Sum test to compare in for uh, using a non-parametric method. It doesn't assume normality, but it does assume that you've got the same population shapes. All right, chapters five, four, and six are for one-way ANOVA. That's when you've got multiple populations and you want to compare the mean between all populations. So this example is actually a data set from Albuquerque. Um, I'm not sure that Levi Strauss st still has a manufacturing plant here, but we used to uh, we used to, and we used to worry about how much waste runup, meaning extra denim material that was being wasted um, when humans did layout of jeans and oh back then it was probably jean jackets and jean t-shirts and jean everything um, versus when a computer does that layout and that we had five different plants okay or different plants PT1 through PT5 and we were wanting to compare the mean of the, of those five plants uh, whenever possible I cite where I get my data set from and here's the citation for that in the footnote so there's all the data and the data for this is on the website so if I go back over to the website and scroll down oh. Well, this one's not. <laughs> okay, I'll do better about that. I'll make sure that that gets on here. Um, it's not on here because it's right inside the notes. So if I'm in the R program and I scroll on down, there is um, the data for this example. So all the data is available. You'll never need to, at least in my class, uh, to hand type data set in there. Not that that would be an unreasonable expectation. Okay, uh, you should be able to reshape data set from wide format, which this data set is, to long format. So this wide format has the five samples each in its own column, and what long format is, is to stack all those up. So you have one variable, which is the measurements, and then a second column which indicates which group the measurement came from. And reshape, or the reshape2 package, um, is preferred. The, the function melt is one way to do that. And so that should be familiar to you. Here is the long format, and you can see that this data frame, waste.long, which I just created, has one variable which indicates which category or which plant the data came from and then we have the value of the of all those measurements and we have all 95 observations here now in in these two columns all right um, I would like you to be able to use plier which is a powerful function for applying operations to different groups in a data set. Basically it takes a data set, it splits the data set up into, by group, for each group it applies a function, and then it combines the results of the function over the groups so that you have a summary. And so in this case we're calculating the mean, standard deviation, and sample size by each plant in the data set. We're also calculating standard errors and margin of errors and a few other things. And after all this, I'm sure I've created an output. So here is the five plants. Here's the mean for plant one, plant two, and so on. Standard deviation, sample sizes, and so on. Easy way to write um, complicated summaries by group. And once you've... Um, created those summaries, you can use that. Oh. 
to create beautiful plots. So here's a plot that has the plants on the x-axis, P1 through P5, run up on the y-axis. Uh, and we've got the dots, which are the actual data, on top of lots of things. We've got a gray line at zero. And the reason why we have some negative numbers is these are comparisons between how well, here I've titled it, plant run-up waste relative to computer layout. So when, if this, this is comparing humans to computers, all right, so when it's below zero, humans are doing better than computers, and when it's above zero, the computers are winning. So you can see on average, even back then, computers were winning. I've got the box plot of the data. I have a red diamond for the mean of each uh, sample, and then I have a confidence interval for the population mean for each of the five. And I also have a dotted line for the grand mean of all five groups. So a lot of information in this one plot. I will encourage you to make plots like that throughout the semester. All right, I'm going to scroll on through all the normality tests and the uh, pairwise differences. You should know about pairwise differences using either Tukey or Bonferroni or other methods for controlling those multiple comparisons, uh, plotting residuals to test whether the model assumptions of normality of the residuals are met. And when they're not, performing Kruskal-Wallis is the non-parametric version of ANOVA. All right. And I do all the pairwise comparisons as um, Wilcoxon two sample tests. So I'll come back in the next video, and I'll finish this chapter, starting at Chapter 7. So if, if these ideas are feeling unfamiliar to you, I strongly encourage you to go back to last semester's notes in depth and scan through and make sure that you are, are feeling strong in the things you need to. So that's the first half of Chapter 1 of Advanced Data Analysis 2 with me. Eric Earhart.